Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to the Dean Seekers, another episode. Now, today is a, um, a, a, a topic which is like very close to everyone, is um, how to manage our finances. We all live in today, um, the UK, but obviously we like don't know how to go about our Islamic finances. Now, um, how to go about playing sadqa, paying zakat, and uh, like a lot of people this day and age have a lot of debts living above our means. So uh, we called over today, um, Brother Usman, all the way from Manchester to um, come here and help us with a few questions. And just to give you a bit of background who Usman is. Now Usman um, has qualified in economics and then he's gone on to uh, qualify in Islamic finances and uh, has done a lot more in the Islamic finance field. So uh, with fa- without further ado, Asalaamu Alaikum Usman. Wa Alaikum Asalaamu Wa Rahmatullahi Wa Barakatuh. Jazakallah Khair for inviting me and it's a pleasure for me to be here. Walillahi Alhamd speaking about Islamic finance, which is obviously one of my main passions. Walillahi Alhamd. So it's a good opportunity to educate people about some of the intricate details that are related to and more practical based inshallah so that's our focus that how we can actually implement the principles of islamic finance in our day-to-day life and right. benefit from that inshallah ta'ala. that's it so do you want to give us your background yeah sure so uh in terms of how i got involved within Correct. Islamic finance right so it's a bit of a long story uh, it, but i'll try to summarize it in the sense that uh, growing up when i was in high school i had a bit of a uh, you know trouble uh, experience within uh, high school I was uh, involved in a lot of fighting uh, believe it or not uh, and that was mainly because I wasn't the type of person that could uh, put up with any injustice or oppression taking place mm-hmm. so for example if somebody was getting bullied in front of me I would defend the one who is bullied against the bully so I would always side with the oppressed against the oppressor that was just my nature and I used to get into a lot of trouble on the back of that because I would end up in Fights that were not even mine in that reality. So on a weekly basis, I was on this report card. I was in detention. My parents were getting called in and all of this was happening. And that was purely down to the fact that I just didn't like somebody being bullied or being oppressed. And uh, throughout the years, this was basically my lifestyle in high school, just fighting with literally everyone. Uh, People two, three years above me and, you know, uh, just like that. So I built a bit of a reputation at that time and... uh, Within a couple of years, nobody would basically uh, mess with me, as they say. However, uh, when the financial crisis happened, the global financial crisis in 2007, 2008. That's I was, when I graduated, bro. <laughs> yeah, I was in high school at that time. And uh, obviously, it had it captured all the news headlines and everything was everywhere. So I wanted to understand what's actually happened and uh, what's caused this. Obviously, now we know it's the subprime lending and you know, the mortgages that were given out in America. And there's a saying that the economists often refer to that if America sneezes, the rest of the world catches a cold. And that's exactly what happened in the financial crisis. The American banking system collapsed and those that were following it also suffered. So, and that caused unemployment, poverty, homelessness, you know, inflation, you name it. All these various issues started to come out, right? And uh, that's when I started to look into it. And I basically decided that I'm going to study economics at college and university. So when I went into college 2010 onwards, I was studying economics, you know, trying to really understand what happened, what is economics and what are the solutions and alternatives. And the reason why I mentioned all the fighting, oppression and so on and so forth was because riba, interest, is the ultimate oppression, right? So when I began to understand like how it's ruining lives, right? That's when I decided that this is the new enemy for me mm-hmm. on the horizon, riba. And I'm going to fight this enemy, the enemy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as you know in the Quran, He Azawajal declares war upon riba. He says, Fa'adunu biharbi min Allah. The one who does not leave off uh, riba, then declared upon him is a notice of war from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa so that was heavy for me that those ayat especially you know growing up at the same time I started uh, indulging in Islamic studies and yeah. I went on to then start delivering khutbahs and 
Islamic lectures in different places. And alhamd, we were at Hajj together where I was also delivering lectures and uh, seminars. And alhamd. And alhamd. So, <laughs> yeah, alhamdulillah. So, the, when I started to look into the, the ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, declared upon a riba is basically a notice of war from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I, I reflected and I said, there is no other sin within the Quran upon which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declares war upon. Mm-hmm. There is no other sin, only the sin of riba. Why? So I began to look into it. And also when the Prophet وسلم, in the end of his life, in the farewell sermon at Hajj, he gives the notice against riba. Right? So you put the two and two together and you see how serious of a crime this is. And that's when basically I got involved, uh, at a, uh, I studied it, and then I devoted my career within this as well. So I, upon graduating, I had opportunities to go into the conventional side of things. I had offers on the table, mm-hmm. right, on the back of my lectures because I won an award. So I had opportunities uh, in the conventional side. I graduated with a first class honours. Um, you know, I had a lot, a lot going for me in that sense, but I decided to leave all of that and uh, devote a career into uh, Islamic finance. I began working with one organization, then I began working within Zakat, and then, you know, doors opened up to such an extent yeah. that just pre-COVID, I was actually traveling uh, quite a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, I went to Pakistan, I went to Turkey, I was in Qatar for a short visit, and just, you know, advocating and advising with regards to Islamic finance. So that's how I got involved. And that's the background with regards to why uh, as well, Wallahi alhamd. Yeah, that's great. Now, in regards to obviously Islamic finance, now what you mentioned about um, like how riba is like now making us a slave to it. Now, obviously, like in today's day, we, everyone like now around us is going through it, whether it's a car on finance, whether it is a mortgage, there's a, a loan. You know, like overdrafts, ev- overdrafts, like yeah. the, the list and uh, credit cards, the list yeah. goes, goes on. on and on. We love, we, we're living, everyone's living above their means, so to speak. Hence the riba comes into it. Yeah. Now, I remember back in uh, university days, like um, I took a, a part time job in um, like a car, uh, like a um, company. Yeah. And there they were uh, like their clientele were people living above their means. So basically, people who couldn't afford a car, so who went to every other lender out there and who couldn't get a loan. So yeah. they were targeting them, even though they knew that later on down the line, these people can't, like now, Manage, pay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, can't pay them back. So obviously, they were going to come back with them, like now for the houses, for obviously all the assets, they were going to come, come go after them. Yeah. Now... So tell us a little bit more about obviously like all this, what's going on yeah, around so, us. So of course, because of my involvement, we're working within different Islamic financial organizations. I used to see this on a daily basis. So one of the organizations I worked with was we were providing Sharia compliant uh, loans. Mm-hmm. Essentially, that means interest free loans. Uh, but there was a lot of guidance prior to that from an Islamic point of view, that debt is something that is discouraged only as a last resort, only when you are in desperate need for it and so on and so forth. And a lot of the cases that were coming forward were people who had debt, interest-based debt. Uh, they had gone to loan sharks, paying you know crazy, crazy amounts of interest on top of their loans. So the right. situation was such that some people had been in loan, uh, loans or in debt rather for uh, several years, and they hadn't paid off the principal amount. Correct. Right. Any uh, any contribution, there was no contribution towards the principal amount of the loan that they they had taken, and. Um, all they had been paying is the interest because the interest was like 30% plus, mm-hmm. right? So that's what we, we, we seen and we experienced that a lot of these issues came about as a result of uh, people living above and beyond their means. And if you, when you look at the root cause of why the loans had been taken out, a lot of the times for what they took the loans out were, wasn't a necessity. Mm-hmm. It wasn't needed. Correct. It was just a desire. It was just a want. They just wanted a new car. They just wanted this. They just wanted that. And hence they, you know, are indulged in mortgages, in credit cards, in, in overdrafts and, you know, so many different forms of uh, riba based transactions uh, that it just o- becomes overwhelming. Right. They can't then manage their lives. And one thing some of the scholars mentioned within Islamic finance is that the one who indulges in riba in any way, shape or form, what ends up happening is it becomes a curse because it's a curse, mm-hmm. right? It becomes a curse for them in their 
life in all the other aspects. So it begins to affect their relationships. And I firsthand seen marriages break down as a result of, you know, being in debt and so on and so forth, weren't able to manage their finances on the back of that. And issues caused, marriages uh, ended up in divorce, uh, and you know the children are suffering now, Correct. right? So that's how riba has ruined lives. It's ruined generations, and it's an age-old enemy. Correct. It's an age-old enemy. This is at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He Salah. he uh, warned against it. He campaigned against it, right? When he first moved to Medina, when he migrated to Medina upon Hijra. The first thing that he did, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and this is in the books of Sirah, he sallallahu alaihi wasallam established the masjid, Masjid al Nabawi. Mm -hmm. He established the brotherhood between the Muhajirin and the Ansar, and following on from that, he visited the marketplace of Medina. So it's the third thing that he did. Mm -hmm. Shows the priority that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had, and this is because he is trying to build within the Muslims financial independence. So he goes to the marketplace of Medina, um, which at that time was being run by the Yahud and it was upon their uh, methodology. So there was riba there, there was fraud and deception. So people were lying, cheating, all sorts of uh, horrendous acts were taking place within the marketplace. The Prophet said, we will not be part of this. He came back towards Masjid al Nabwi in a nearby location, instigated and instituted the marketplace of the Muslims. And mm -hmm. said, from here, the Muslims will conduct business. Because business is actually heavily encouraged within Islam. Correct. Okay, and inshallah we'll speak about that in more detail. But the idea be behind the problems that exist is ultimately the ultimate enemy is riba, interest, Correct. right? Even debt, from an Islamic point of view, um, as you mentioned, is discouraged, but it's permissible as long as there's no riba involved. Mm -hmm. Okay, so hence the uh, discussion regarding, for example, you know, living above our means and be beyond our means, it would have been perhaps acceptable if it was being done in an interest-free manner. Correct. Right? Because living above your means is essentially israf. It's essentially being extravagant. And it's Allah SWT warns against that as well in the Quran. Correct. But let's suppose somebody really wanted to buy the luxuries and the delights of this world, but they financed it through halal means, halal channel, halal, you know, uh, funds. It's, that's a different discussion now. But the bigger problem is when it's being funded through interest-based uh, funds and uh, channels like Which that. Which 90% of the people out there, like now all of us, have been involved in. You know, like um, we know or either we have been involved in direct ourselves or we know people of doing yeah. that. Like now close family, close friends. Everyone's around you have somehow, some way, all aspects of their lives have got involved in. Yeah. So we can't hide away so from of that. Course, of course, you know, when talking about uh, living beyond your means, it's, mm -hmm. enough. It's, it's something that we have to touch upon. But the bigger enemy here, and uh, the bigger objective is to get people to move away from riba. And that's the goal behind our discussion. Right. That if we can even inspire someone to start taking the steps towards be living an interest-free life, because it is possible. Correct. People have done it. Right. And there are so many people that are doing it. Correct. So this is why we're speaking about it. And this is why I wanted to just shed, up so shed some light upon you know, uh, what interest is and the problems uh, that, that come forth with it. Uh, but just to touch upon Islamic finance, because uh, that's my area mm -hmm. of expertise. This is basically what I'm focusing on. Advisory consultancy, even executive level, uh, I've worked within this space. Mashallah. And uh, what I've noticed is that a lot of people don't understand what Islamic finance is. So mm -hmm. in summary, Islamic finance is essentially not indulging in riba, Right. Uh, not indulging in anything that is haram. So n no business or trade takes place with regards to anything which is prohibited in Islam. Yeah. So alcohol, you have uh, adult entertainment, which is haram. You have um, uh, uh, gambling, tobacco, music, firearms, illegal activities. All of this is basically rendered null, void and haram Correct. within Islam. Yeah. And hence, Islamic finance means there's no investments or trade related to this. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's that's something that we need to mention that people understand this, that any business or any type of investment that is generating income or profit through this is haram. Correct. Okay. And then obviously you have the, the principle of equity and asset backed finance. Mm -hmm. That's Islamic finance. Okay. And it's ethical. Whereas the conventional finance is built upon debt based. Okay. And Islamic finance also has within it this principle of profit 
and loss sharing. Where risk is shared. Yeah. Right? So if me and yourself go into a partnership, in, into a business, we share the risk. And as a result of that, we share the profits as well. And that's something that is Islamic is done at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. It was something that was endorsed. The co companions took part in this, which is known as Musharaka or Mudaraba, if you like. Mm -hmm. And this is what the companions did. And this is a principle that has lived on. And you'll find this in the books of uh, Islamic finance. And it's being practiced in Islamic banking. Okay. okay. So these are the things, some of the things. And then we will always need to uh, speak about waqf and zakat and sadaqah, these are separate discussions yeah. inshallah for another day. But the problem behind uh, interest is, is, is so interesting, right? <laughs> uh, because believe it or not, now there are actually non-Muslim academics and economists that are warning against uh, this. Correct. Okay. So the uh, discussions regarding absolute poverty, extreme poverty, somewhere along the line within this, this discussion, interest is actually... Uh, put in as a root cause of this problem. Correct. Inequality, interest is discussed as a root cause. There's a book by an economist called Thomas Piketty. It's entitled Capital in the 21st Century. And in this book, he doesn't really talk about interest in, in reality because he's uh, not a Muslim. You don't expect him to. But what he does is he, he does show how wealth inequality has come about mm -hmm. in the last century or so. Right, um, and in the end of the book, so it's a large book, right? Mm -hmm. Seven hundred pages. I can't summarize it, <laughs> but in the end of the book, he does mention something quite interesting. He proposes a solution, right, which gets heavily criticized by the overwhelming majority of the people. Mm -hmm. They appreciated the first part of the book where he's showing data and analysis with regards to how there is wealth and income inequality, but in the end, when he proposes a solution, there's a controversy. Okay. The solution is that he suggests that there should be a global wealth tax, right, on you know, assets and capital yeah. and so forth. Obviously, it's going to cause a controversy because the rich and the elite are not going to like this, right? <laughs> right? But you see how he's saying wealth tax and not income tax. Mm -hmm. And when you look at zakat, it is a type of wealth tax. Wealth tax, yeah. Right, two point five percent on an annual basis. You contribute, and it's a charitable contribution. It's faith based. And it is a type of wealth tax. Mm -hmm. So you see the solutions are already within Islam, whilst the leading economists and the leading figures within this space are still trying to figure it all out. Correct. So it just shows us that Islam is a complete way of life. Everything is already put in place, figured out, whilst the rest of the world still battles with the challenges and tries to figure it all out. So Correct. that's something I wanted to mention. No, it's true. <laughs> I like uh, just like what you said there. A non-Muslim, I w I came across um, like now um, a guy called Dave Ramsey, right? And a non-Muslim, right, Christian, is talking about like now don't uh, avoid interest at any cost. Yeah. Right, and he's like uh, obviously uh, like now going back twenty thirty years ago from day like now uh, day dot has been going on about in like uh, pay your mortgage off ASAP, yeah. pay your debts off ASAP, you know, like if you got a car on finance, yeah. get rid of it, right, either sell it, <laughs> right, or either pay it off. Yeah, the reason behind that is because uh, obviously they don't believe it's haram, but they know that it causes harm. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> right? right. Why? Because when you look into it, into what interest really is, it's the cost of borrowing money. Correct. Okay. Now, when you are in need, that's when you borrow money, right? Correct. Generally speaking, or how it should be at least, that you only borrow money when you are in need of it. Correct. Now, if you are in need, and then on top of that, you're having to pay interest, it doesn't add up, mm -hmm. first and foremost. Secondly, interest has uh, this element of compound. So interest is compounded. Mm -hmm. It's not just a fixed rate of interest that you're paying. There is... is Built upon is compounded, right? I don't right. Have daily, to, it's, weekly, it's monthly, yearly. Exactly, exactly. And then this is why people end up in this cycle of only paying the interest and never ever actually getting towards paying the debt off. Correct. So this is a huge issue and a huge problem that needs to be addressed and highlighted so that people can benefit from uh, from this and make an informed decision before entering into any debt-based contract that has within it riba now a lot of people who will probably be listening to this already might have one or two or even five like now debts yeah. interest-based debts now what advice would you say to them who have got like now a huge mountain of debt 
Yeah. So the ad- advice that we give within the space is that if you can uh, f- seek Qard uh, Hassan, right, which basically means interest free loan, whether it's through friends and family or whether it be through uh, institutions, Walilah there are uh, developments within the Islamic finance industry. Um, with the rise of fintech and mashallah there are organizations out there that are helping uh, people become debt free are you okay to share some of them links then we can yeah, like uh, share it with the podcast you uh, never know this uh, I, can I will, come I will show, with anyone i, I will sh- definitely share a, a couple that that come to mind and uh, mm-hmm. come to light uh, in terms of this but the idea behind it is that even if you can get it through friends and family and so forth uh, let's suppose you're in debt of 5000 pounds and is accruing interest or on a monthly basis Pay that off through getting a loan through your friends and family that is Qard Hassan, that is interest free. Once you've paid it off, then you can, you know, repay your friends and family without the interest element. Mm-hmm. Right. This is to safeguard yourself from this curse, this war with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger. Uh, so this That's is right. why that, that solution is given. But I just wanted to highlight, you know, uh, with regards to um, the net flow of income mm-hmm. when it comes to interest so let's suppose i'm in need Mm -hmm. i'm uh, suffering financially going through a financial hardship and you mashallah are an affluent individual you have a disposable income and so on and so forth so i come to you and say brother saeed i'm in need of ten thousand pounds for example Mm -hmm. right you give me the ten thousand pounds but you attach with it interest Mm -hmm. right i'm just giving an example now, what's happening in this scenario is when I pay you back that ten thousand pounds plus the interest, whatever that interest ends up being due to compound interest, right? Is what's happening is the net flow of income is going from the poor to the rich, right? Thus widening the gap between the rich and the poor, causing inequality, and the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. This mm-hmm. is basically the essence of it all. When you see um, inequality taking place. At an individual level and then at a national level, you see yeah. that the amount of poverty, for example, in third world countries, mm-hmm. you just see it in front of you. But it all started through this net flow of income being transferred from the poor to the rich Correct. as a result of interest and uh, what we just spoke about. So th- this is just an example of, uh, of it all. And then when you speak about, for example, banking, the banking crisis, you look at fractional reserve banking, which is the banks are basically only holding a proportion of the money that is deposited in there. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, for example, 90%, they only hold 10% and they loan out 90%. And then through that, another 90% and another 90%. And basically, it's just money that is being just created digitally and loaned out. Uh, in this attempt to maximize profit, but in reality is interest. Because they're giving it out as loans and they know that this is how they make their money uh, through compound interest and interest. And as a result, more and more people are becoming in debt. And a, a big part of the problem is consumerism. Okay, uh, this, you know, the extent to it. Right. Advertising and marketing has played a part in this that they've tweaked our psychology now over the years Mm -hmm. that we think certain brands certain uh, goods and services are a need whereas in reality if you were to actually do an analysis let's make let's say you go home and you make a list of a hundred items that you have the different clothing the brands and the gadgets that you have you make a list of it make a list of a hundred items that you possess right and then really question yourself on whether it's something that's needed or it's a want or it's beyond that right and then that's when you start to realize that you know perhaps you have become a victim of consumerism whereas what we should be doing is as believers in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we should try to adopt within our lives a zuhd mm-hmm. right which is that we are content with with little we don't need to have these possessions and so on and so forth just have what you need to have Right. If it's something for work, if it's something for your business, that's understandable. Right. But when you enter into this consumer mindset where you're all the time in need of new gadgets and you know different products that are just out there, not serving any benefit, then that's where the problem comes in. 
Again, living without you, like now above your means. Living again, above and beyond your means. That's it. Yeah. That's why it comes down to. But even it? even for example, let's suppose we have some uh, brothers, mashallah, tabarakallah, uh, ancestors who are you know millionaires and billionaires, right? right? For for all intents and purposes, even within within for them, they might be able to afford. So they it's within their means to be able to buy an expensive car and you know go to those expensive restaurants where the bill comes out to be. Forty thousand pounds or whatever it is for mm-hmm. a meal, even then, in and of itself, that's extravagant. Correct. Right? Yes, it's within their means, but is the item worth what you're paying? <laughs> you have to assess that. You have a to. A true millionaire that. wouldn't spend. A true millionaire. Extra- would, extravagant. Yeah. It wouldn't. He'll invest it. <laughs> yeah, and they wouldn't no longer be millionaires if they were spending like that all the time. Correct. But we'll speak about investments as well because I think that's an interesting point that. Generally speaking, if you have, for example, let's say ten thousand pounds saved up, and uh, you don't really factor in investments, what happens is there's this phenomenon known as inflation. Mm-hmm. Inflation is that basically the value of goods and services is being eroded away okay. over a year within any given economy. Prices are rising, mm-hmm. so an item, if it's a hundred pounds today, is not going to be hundred pounds tomorrow. The right. values, the, the, the prices are increasing. Mm-hmm. So on the back of the inflation, what's happening is that the your savings, you're actually losing out. 2%, 2.5%, whatever it is. On top of that, as Muslims, we're paying zakat, 2.5%. So that's 5% gone. On top of that, you know, other expenses and, you know, all of that stuff happening. You're losing up to 10% a year, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? So if you don't invest... You're just gonna that investment's just gonna your savings are just going to go. They're just gonna get eroded. But if you invest, generally investments, the returns if it's a good return, it'll be ten percent or so. So you just barely made your uh, the value back in real right. terms. Mm-hmm. So. So what's your take on mutual funds then? <laughs> that's a separate topic for another day. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of the detail, that's gonna be covered within that. Uh, but essentially, the idea is that Sharia compliant investments are a reality mm-hmm. they are happening in the world and there are various ways in which one can maximize their wealth you can invest in you know uh, assets that are sharia compliant shares global stocks mm-hmm. uh, emerging market stocks you have real estate you have gold and other precious metals you have sukuk which is essentially islamic bonds right, right. and you have uh, we can invest in startups and this is a, a discussion that i wanted to have with regards to entrepreneurship that this is what needs to be encouraged the right. Muslims starting their own businesses and challenging the other uh, players within the markets and the industries. This is something that needs to happen uh, going forward and for the Muslims to become really established, inshallah ta'ala. I'm in that field, right? And a lot of people are doing that. You know, yeah. we, we don't see it out and about, yeah. but a lot of Muslims, mashallah, like they are diversifying themselves and getting our products, it's Muslim products, halal products yeah. out there. We we need to be doing much more than that. Yeah. Compared to other. The countries. whole idea is that you know Warren Buffett is one of the largest. You know he has one of the largest investment portfolios. He's right. one of the richest uh, people in the world, um, within the top ten, mm-hmm. right? And you know he has given a lot in charity as well. Yeah. So you know perhaps himself and Bill Gates would be at the top of the list, but they've given a lot in charity, so that's why they've fallen down uh, within the list over the years. And others have you know taken the. The top space mm-hmm. because they just come out and they're very aggressive, right? Uh, but again, with Warren Buffett, he his investment uh, um, methodology uh, minus the aspect of interest is actually very uh, much you can appreciate because he's talking about diversifying your streams of income. He says never rely on one source of income. Correct. Why? Because, you know, if you think about it, your expenses. On a monthly basis, you're paying for this, you're paying for that, you're paying here, you're paying there. All these expenses are going out of your account, out of your pocket. But when it comes to your source of income, you only have one source of income, your job or business or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Right? So only one source of income is coming in and multiple expenses are you. being paid through that. Mm-hmm. Sooner or later, there will be an imbalance. Sooner or later, there will be burden that's put upon that source of income. So this is why he's speaking about the idea of diversifying your streams of income through investments and through uh, entrepreneurship and through, you know, uh, 
looking at the world through this lens where you're you know looking at it from an and thinking outside the box right from an islamic perspective so inshallah this is something that we're working on at the moment uh, if anybody's interested we share the details inshallah they can inshallah. get in touch and have this discussion regarding investments about entrepreneurship about uh, islamic finance and inshallah we can give guidance on that Correct. there's a lot of resources out there for example uh, there's a lot of books a lot of material mashallah tabarakallah that's out there and real world solutions and alternatives to it all Correct. not just theory but actual real world solutions islamic mm -hmm. banking is on the rise islamic banking is now uh, approximately worth 5 trillion dollars across the world Correct. The, the global banking assets that uh, are uh, within islamic finance also is growing it was growing up to 20% per annum prior to, prior to covid-19 correct through covid-19 is grown at you know over 10% per annum this is huge correct. huge and even when you look at the financial crisis that took place and this is something i mentioned within my research thesis at the university and one of the rationals behind why the dissertation was exceptionally appreciated is that when the financial crisis happened all the other markets in the world were collapsing and buckling and so on and so forth with the exception of few right. such as like inferior goods they were on the rise inferior goods basically means cheaper alternatives mm -hmm. to known brands they were on the rise because obviously people don't have the money to <laughs> buy the actual brands or the recognized brands so they're going for the cheaper alternatives with the exceptions of a few other markets like that those that are needs and the habit forming goods which basically like you know tobacco and cigarettes and stuff like that because that's a habit people can't give that up daily use yeah daily use and uh, unfortunately that's a problem that's something that we need to speak about as well huge amounts of money gets wasted within these habit forming goods whatever your addictions are and so forth inshallah next topic like now we will go into detail yeah one thing at a time so yeah. we'll like now inshallah our next topic together yeah when we like you get some time Osman, of course, <laughs> busy of course. guy <laughs> no 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 uh, any time for you yeah. any time for our rahma <laughs> faith center mashallah yeah, so yeah inshallah we'll close like now yeah. the topic just today to, just we'll to sort of add give a few context things. that you know mm -hmm. this was an overview uh, there's a lot of discussions to be had with regards to Islamic finance, right. zakat and waqf. This is a main area uh, of Islamic finance, something to uh, look into. You have uh, the prohibition of riba. There's so much depth covered within that. You have the new developments taking place, right. Islamic fintechs, Islamic investment spaces, Islamic banking, all of it is growing. And like I was mentioning, the financial crisis, when it happened, the markets were collapsing, but Islamic banking was ever on the rise. Correct. And this goes back to the time of the Prophet وسلم, when he established the foundations of Islamic finance. And after Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam departed and returned to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, the Muslim economy was on the rise, mm -hmm. whilst other economies, superpower economies of the world, were collapsing. So there is something inherent within Islamic finance that is at the heart of it all. And I always ask this question: Is the success of Islamic finance a mere co coincidence? Or is it at the core principles that it possesses? That's something to look into. Is it just a coincidence that it's, oh, the banking, conventional banking collapses, but Islamic banking is on the rise? It's, co conventional banks have to be bailed out by the governments Correct. using taxpayer money, Correct. whereas Islamic banking is on the rise. So this is something that is worth looking into. Uh, and, you know, uh, we'll share our details and anybody who's interested uh, can reach out and we can uh, have a fruitful discussion once again, inshallah ta'ala. Inshallah. Well, Jazakal Hair, once again, as well, for coming feet. down. Uh, really appreciate you coming down and taking your time out for us for uh, today's uh, podcast. So, inshallah, um, we'll be seeing you again. Inshallah. Um, okay, again, Jazakal Hair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.